Now you have less than a minute before service begins. <laughs> All right, come on in and find your seat. We'll begin worship in a moment. Good morning. Good morning. It is so good to have you with us this morning, whether you're joining us in person or online. Thank you so much for being here. Jack, good to see you, man. Good to see you. All right. Um, this is the day the Lord has made. Amen. Amen. And the Bible says we are to rejoice and be glad in it. And so we're going to do that uh, all, all throughout our service today. Now, uh, I want you to, to grab your bulletin if you've got it. and Let me run through a few brief announcements with you. Let me grab mine so I remember everything that I'm supposed to talk about this morning. Our special offering this month is going towards Hub City, our Hub City La Grande, Oregon church plant, and uh, we've been hearing about that for uh, uh, for uh, the past several weeks, and and uh, uh, we have already uh, brought in quite a bit for them, and so thank you so much for your generosity, and, and please continue that uh, for the for this week and next week as we uh, continue to help support our Hub City church. They are in their I think fourth week that they're going to be uh, starting uh, tonight, so. Uh, Please be, be praying for them, praying for that ent entire region, for a revival to begin there and for a revival to begin here too in Colville, even as it is beginning a around our country as well. Uh, man camp, there's flyers out there for, uh, for man camp out on the, the uh, table out there. So gentlemen, please feel free to take one of those and uh, you can talk to myself or Pastor Dick about some information about that. Love to have you sign up and, uh, and go to that uh, at Camp Sanders, all right? Wednesday evening, of course, is our Cross Connect Ministries. And uh, as always, we have a great time. Now, this week is going to be uh, is going to be our potluck week. All right, so we did this last month, and it worked out really well. You guys did so good in uh, in helping to support our uh, our kids and our, our volunteers uh, on that night. So this Wednesday night, if you would like to bring something, in, and please come and stay uh, for for the fun. We have a meal at five thirty, and then six o'clock we we have a little song time with the kids and any adults that want to come, and then we have classes 
services for everything from children all the way up through adults. And so we'd love to have you be a part of that. All right. So uh, just so you know, this, this week is our potluck week. All right. So, so pay special attention to that. All right. A couple other things to let you know about uh, our Easter egg. Easter is coming. We're going to have an Easter egg hunt. This is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm starting to get real excited about Easter. Easter is my favorite time of the year. And, uh, and so we're going to have a, a wonderful time together fellowshipping and worshiping and encouraging one another and be inspired and all sorts of stuff. So um, for right now, though, you need to know that we're going to have an Easter egg hunt on Easter morning, okay? So here's what we need. We need some plastic eggs and some candy, all right? Now, I want to show you here uh, kind, of, kind of what we need so that you get an idea of what it's all supposed to be like, okay? All right? So, so we need eggs about this size, all right? This size holds a nice piece of candy in there, and you can maybe see that little starburst that's in there, okay? And, and even eggs like this would be okay, too, as well, the bigger ones, all right? We don't really need too many of these big honking ones, though, right? We, we don't, I mean, uh, we got to pack them full of candy, you know, and so, so we might need a few of these, all right? But, but really, we need a whole bunch of these, all right? So these and this size, uh, especially, are the two that, two that we really need. Please try not to get anything smaller than this, all right? They do have the little mini eggs, but those are for wimps, all right? All right, so, so we're, 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 a, we're a real manly, I don't know what I'm saying. Anyway, just, just bring about that size eggs, okay, for, for the Easter egg hunt. So we need a whole bunch of them, okay? And uh, so we need candy, Easter candy. And I've noticed they've started to put the candy out at Walmart and other places. So uh, as you're shopping, please bring up some, some extra candy. Just bring it by the church here. We'll have some collection uh, baskets or buckets or something uh, for you for that, all right? I'm going to give this to my wife so I don't have to hold on to those. All right. All right. Yes. The Easter egg hunt's going to be here at the church. At the church. Yeah. Yeah. So Easter morning, uh, and we're still kind of, kind of planning this now, but Easter morning, we're going to have an egg hunt. We're going to have a service and we're going to have a meal. Um, and uh, so uh, it's going to be a fantastic, wonderful morning. All right. You're going to hear more about that as it comes along. But yeah, we'll have the Easter egg hunt uh, somewhere out here or inside or whatever we can, we can do. All right. Now, I will let you know that uh, uh, my last uh, Easter egg hunt that we did back in Wisconsin before Pam and I moved here uh, was uh, we had about 2,000 eggs eggs that we, uh, that we uh, stuffed, all right? And honestly, we did most of the, st- actually, Pam did most of the stuffing of that, all right? So, um, so uh, we're, we're looking for a lot of Easter eggs. We're going to have a lot of kids here. It's going to be a whole lot of fun, all right? So, so just uh, be aware of that. Cheesy Pastors, of course, every week on our Facebook page at Wednesday at 11 a.m. too as well. And uh, I think that's all the, I think that's all the announcements I had this morning. Uh, so, Let's pray together. Would you stand together and let's pray? And we're going to begin a time of coming before the Lord in worship and to glorify His name. Heavenly Father and our God, we thank You that You are here this morning. And Father, as we quiet our hearts and our spirits now, uh, Lord, we thank You for everything You're doing in the life of our church. But God, now we turn our attention to You. And and Lord, we, we ask that every heart would be lifted high in praise to you. Every voice lifted high in praise. Every hand lifted high in praise. Every heart lifted high in praise to you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I was reading in the psalm and praying to get ready for service this morning. And I ran across, I was reading in the psalm, and I read that, that phrase, Worship Him in the beauty of holiness. If any of you, that's familiar, I think, to many of us, to worship God in the beauty of holiness. And, and it struck me this morning, I'd never understood that verse before I realized today. But when you and I are, are saved, when we come to salvation in Christ, we confess our sins and we ask Jesus to wash us from our sins, right? We become a Christian. In fact, we become beautiful to God, that God views each and every one of you who have accepted Christ as beautiful. And in fact, that's what that verse means. Another literal literal translation says, come and worship the Lord in the beauty of holy vestments. You understand? It's what the priest wore. So when the priest went in to worship God, he put on these beautiful garments, right? And that's what the verse is saying. 
is that the Lord wants us to come before him and he will see each and every one of you and me as beautiful. Come and worship him in the beauty of holiness. I always attributed that to God's beauty, but no, it's how God sees us. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Isn't that good news? Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Proclaim his triumph day by day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring a gift and come into his courts. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give him thanks and bless his name for the Lord is good and his love is everlasting and his faithfulness endures to all generations. One, two, three, four. There we go. Come, let us worship our King. Oh, come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great. Yes, he has. See what our Savior has done. Oh, see how his love overcomes. He has done great things. Oh, he has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God. You have done great things. Well, that's in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Oh, yes, great things. Been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. No, oh, you will do great things. Oh, God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you come. and break every chain oh god you have done great things we'll dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high
Let the heavens rejoice, let the nations be glad, let the whole earth tremble, for you are God. Come and worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Oh, let the heavens, let the heavens rejoice. Let the nations be glad, let the whole earth tremble, for you are God. Go and worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Oh, as we is not a high priest unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who, because of his likeness to us, has been tested in every way, only without sin. Let us therefore boldly approach the throne of our gracious God, where we may find and receive mercy, and in his grace find timely help. As we sing again, please come and pray, come and pray. Father and our God, be lifted up. That's the cry of our heart, Lord, that you would be glorified, that you would be honored, that you would be praised in our lives. Lord, no matter what we're, what we're facing, no matter what our circumstances may be, what our situations may be that we are in, we can always turn to you. And we can always lift your name on high. And we can always lift our hearts, our voices, our hands, our faces towards you in worship. You are always available, God. You never turn us away. You never leave us. You never forsake us. And so as Bruce has said, as your scripture declares, we can approach the throne of grace with confidence, boldly, knowing that you hear us. So God, this morning, we come to you with that boldness. We come to you with that confidence. We ask, God, that you would do a work in each heart here that, that only you can know, God. God, we pray for your power upon each life. We pray for your Holy Spirit to fall on each heart. God, that we may leave this place changed, that we will have experienced you, that we will know you deeper and more intimately than ever before. Father God, we pray and lift up those who are hurting, those who are struggling. 
whether that's physically, emotionally, spiritually, whatever way, God, we pray your healing touch upon all lives. Lord, we thank you for what you are doing across our country. We, we think of the, of the revival that is still going on at Asbury Seminary. And God, we pray for that especially. We pray for those who are lining up around the block just to come and, and experience just a taste of you. And for those who have worshipped, who have given their testimonies, who have spoken your word into lives, God, we thank you and we pray that that revival would continue and it would spread across our land. Lord, we thank you that you are here among us. We thank you, God, that that revival can happen even right here in Colville, Washington, God. Let it begin with us, Lord. May our hearts be turned towards you in ways never seen before. God, may we serve you harder. May we love you more. May we speak about you with more boldness than we ever have before. God, may your name be lifted high in our lives, in our hearts, in our voices, in our actions, in our words, and our deeds, God. May it all be for your glory, your honor, and your praise. You alone are God, and we give you praise this morning. We thank you, God, that you are here with us, and we will follow you. We will love you, both now and and for the rest of our days into eternity. Thank you, Jesus. In your name, in your holy, wonderful, amazing name, we pray. Amen. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the nations be glad. Let the whole earth tremble. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let the heavens, let the heavens rejoice. Let the nations be glad. Let the whole earth tremble. the pastor if I could just say a word you can be seated um, you know as we sang this in the beauty of holiness and this has been bothering me a long time um, and I'll just say it I was, I was praying the reason why I came up forward because I want to be holy before the Lord I want him to receive my offering gladly. And so um, there's something in the way. And what that is, is I've been critical of you, Pastor Dale. And I've said it to a couple of my close friends, just kind of fault finding. And I want to ask your forgiveness. Since I said it to a few people, it's, I just want to ask your forgiveness for being critical of you. You are forgiven. And you are loved. Thank I love you. you. Thank you. Since the revival started out, and revival comes when we get rid of sin. And yep. every time I go into prayer, I go before a holy God with an unholy heart. And that was the thing. So thank you for forgiving me.
Can we, uh, Bruce, can we just, can we do that again? To just be lifted up. You, you all can stay seated. Just, let's just, let's just continue to worship, okay? Yeah. Let's just do that. Let's do it. I was thinking the same thing. Lift him up. Praise God. Oh, be lifted up. Oh, be lifted up. As we bow down. Be lifted up. Oh, be So, Lord, we thank you that you can make any of us holy, Lord, by your shed blood, your precious shed blood. Come, Lord, forgive us every sin. God, we want to take on your righteousness. You are our righteousness, Lord Jesus. It's the only righteousness we have is you. And we say thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We offer ourselves to you, Lord Jesus. Name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, praise team. Dick, where'd you go? Oh, you're back there. Brother Dick, thank you. Thank you so much. It's hard sometimes to express what is in the heart, isn't it? Even, even you know, when, when we say, hey, come before God, sometimes there are those things that we still tend to hold on to, to hold back from, right? You know, and, 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 and we don't want others to, to see it, and, and we even try to hide it from God, too had those things in my life. You've had them in your life. The Bible says that when we repent, and repentance is a 180 degree turn. That's what the word literally means. Just turning around, facing a different direction. When we do that, that's when we see the face of God. Because isn't it so that when we're, when we're turning away from God, we, we, can't, we can't see his face, right? You know, it's impossible. When we turn back to him, when we make that 180 degree turn, and that's not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to confess to other brothers and sisters. It's not an easy thing to confess to God sometimes. But that's where healing is found. That's where healing is found. Thank you, Pastor Dick, so much. So much. Whew. Wow. Yeah. I guess, I guess where we go from here is uh, we, just, we just bring the kids up, you know? Come on, kids. It's, a, it's our time together. Let's have a little fun, all right?
Grace is already up here. We got others? Yeah, there they come. All right. Come on up, girls. They're coming. All right. Oh. Cody, you coming up too, man? All right. All right. There we go. Oh, look at it. Oh, you even get a round of applause. Come up, girls. Here, go ahead. You can sit up there. There you go. All right. Whew. Good to see everybody. Oh, how you doing today? Good, good. All right, I am, I am too. Hey, I got something in here. Now, uh, anybody know what happened a, a couple of weeks ago? What football game was played a couple of weeks ago? What was it? Super Bowl. Yeah, Super Bowl was played. You know, I found out something really interesting. You know what the, what the most popular snack for people to eat during the Super Bowl is? Anybody have any idea? Somebody say it? <laughs> it's not Dr. Pepper. It should be. It should be Dr. Pepper. That's true. That's true, but it's not. It's chicken wings. Chicken wings, yes. Did you know, this is true, this is a true fact, that over 1.5 billion chicken wings were eaten during the weekend of the Super Bowl. That's a lot of chicken wings, right? Now, do you guys like chicken wings? Yeah, no? You, you, you never had them before? I've got some chicken wings in here. I really do. Check it out. Look at these. Look at those. Look, yeah, yeah. Can I, see it? Can I show the camera? Oops. Oh, if I go that way. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. They're chicken wings. Yeah. Now, okay. Does anybody want to try one? No? <laughs> Cody? <laughs> Good question. Thou shalt not lie. They are edible. They are edible. Yes. Yes, they are. They are edible. Yeah. 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 Now, do, do, do they look like chicken wings? Well, well, they got they got the shape right of chicken wings, but something something seems wrong with them, right? Okay, but it says I've got the box it right in here, and the box says that they are chicken wings. All right, it says it says it right there on the bottom. It says it says chicken wings. Okay, wow, maybe I should try one. What do you think? Should I try one? No, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it just for just to see. These have got to, these have got to be real chicken wings. You know, here we go. Wait a minute. Chicken wings made with white chocolate and cayenne pepper. <laughs> oh, goodness. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hang on. Give me just a second. Uh, well, now they look like chicken wings. <clears throat> yeah, they're spicy. They look like, but when you bite into them, <clears throat> it's definitely chocolate. The chocolate's good. The cayenne pepper's a little strong, okay? <laughs> Stronger than I thought it was going to be. <sighs> but that's our, I wasn't going to let the kids eat them. Don't worry about it, okay? <laughs> but he, here's, here's the spiritual lesson here, kids. Sometimes something looks really good in our lives. Sometimes uh, sin uh, comes in and it says, hey, hey. T take advantage of me, Eat, you know, do something. Like, like maybe sometimes sin comes in and says, hey, you know, it would, be, it would be a whole lot easier maybe if you, if you told a little lie to your parents or if maybe you cheated on a test or, or maybe even, even if you stole a candy bar from a supermarket or something. And sin comes in and says, hey, do something wrong, but nothing bad's going to happen to you. It's going to be good for you, all right? But sin always has a bite to it, all right? When, when we do something which is wrong, okay, there's always, it always seems like it's going to be good, but in the end, it's not, all right? And so that's why Jesus came to take away our sins. Jesus came to give us new life so that we don't have to sin anymore. Sometimes sin is deceiving, all right? It, it shows up as, as one thing. It looks like something good, but it's really not. It's something really evil, all right? So just pay attention to, uh, and only do good things in your life, okay? And follow God, all right? Let's pray, because that cayenne pepper is coming back to bite me, all right? <laughs> so let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, so much that you love us. Thank you, God, that you help us tell the difference between right and wrong in our lives. And I pray for these kids, Lord, as they grow. I pray that they would know that discernment of your Holy Spirit. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Woo, thanks, kids. Woo, anybody else want to try one? No? No? No takers. All right. You'll take one, Jordan? There you go, buddy. There you go. <laughs> Better have some water handy. What's that? Oh. Oh, certainly, if you'd like to do that. Uh. 
All right. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah, good job, guys. Good to have you. Good to have you on the team. Whew, okay. I really wasn't sure how that was going to go this morning. I got to tell you. And I probably should not have taken as big a bite of that as I did. But hey, whew. so if my head turns red or is already red, I apologize. Am I perspiring? I am kind of sweating a little bit, yeah. So I tell you what, <clears throat> why don't you all take a little break? Why don't you stand up and give somebody a hug or a handshake while I recover, all right? And then we'll dig into God's Word, all right? Thank you. It was a little hot. It was... All right, if you would head back to your seats, <clears throat> I think I've recovered enough to keep going here this morning. Whew. All right, go ahead and find your seat, and we'll keep going here. Thank you again so much for being here today and for being a part of our service. I think my voice has recovered sufficiently. We'll see, all right, after all of that. I told my wife at the break, I said, that, that was a little hotter than I anticipated they were going to be, you know. But, but if, you, if you want some of those, they are, that's a real thing, by the way. I got them at Walmart. Yeah, really. They were, it was pre, I think it was pre-Valentine's Day stuff they had them in there. I, I don't know why, but yeah, they were, they were there with the seasonal things, and I saw that, and I said, I can make a kid's time out of this, you know. Jordan liked it? You liked it? Yeah. Did you have to, well, I see you got a glass of water there, man. Yeah, of course. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, he ate the whole thing. I only took one little bite of it, so good for you, man. Good for you. Good for you. All right. Well, uh, <clears throat> this morning... Now that we're all back in our seats and now that, uh, now that my voice is, is back to normal, I want to take you on a little trip, okay? And, and this is a trip that, that maybe you might be a little familiar with, all right? So let's, let's start the trip here. Just sit right back and you'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip that started from this tropic port aboard this tiny ship. The mate was a mighty sailing man, the skipper brave and sure. Five passengers set sail that day for a three-hour tour, a three-hour tour. <laughs> the weather started getting rough, the tiny ship was tossed. If not for the courage of the fearless crew, the minnow would be lost, the minnow would be lost. The ship's aground on the shore of this uncharted desert isle With Gilligan, the skipper too The millionaire and his wife The movie star, the professor and Mary Ann Here on Gilligan's Isle You sang louder at that than you do in worshiping the Lord! What is that? What is that all about? I couldn't believe it when y'all started singing. I was like, man, they're doing louder than... Woo, okay. Well, now that we know y'all can sing, there's no excuse next week, all right, when, when we do worship, all right? Uh, all right. Uh, I want you to... Uh, don't worry, that, that actually does fit into my sermon somehow. We'll, we'll find out. But I, I want you right now to take a look at this picture that will be up on the screen of our sign out front, all right? There it is. Now, what is, I'll kind of get out of the way so, so you can see a little bit better. I want to ask you something. What is unique 
about, about that sign? What's unique about it? What will, what will never be duplicated anywhere else in Colville or, or anywhere? What's, what's unique about this sign? Colville Free Methodist Church, our name. Now, you know what Colville is, right? We all live here, all right? And, and, and you know what a church is. But I got to ask you the question, what's with the two words in the middle? Free Methodist. What's that all about? What, what does that even mean? And, and are those words going to hold any relevance to being able to serve and experience God right here? Now, I'm starting a new sermon series today, and I very much hope that by the end of this sermon series, you're going to be inspired and you're going to be encouraged by what God is doing through the Free Methodist Church. And here's the thing, there's a little bonus attached to this, all right, because this sermon series is going for six weeks. So if you make it through the next six weeks of my sermons, whether you watch them here or you watch them online, you're going to be prepared to become a member of the Colville Free Methodist Church if you want to. That's it. You don't have to go to a long, drawn-out membership class full of boring details that don't really matter to you. Instead, over the next six weeks, I want us to get excited about what God is doing, uh, the work that God is, has done, is doing, and wants to do through the Free Methodist Church, and specifically through Colville Free Methodist Church. And I think you're going to want to hitch your pony to the Free Methodist movement, just as I did <laughs> way back when. But, but if you don't, that's cool too, all right? That's all right. Nobody's going to kick you out for not becoming a member at the end of the six weeks, all right? So don't, don't worry about that. But if over the next six weeks, God moves on your heart and nudges you to take that step into membership, then, then I really hope you'll, you'll listen to him and, and respond. It could change your life and, and your direction in life just as it, as it did mine. See, I, I remember the day very well. I was still pretty new to the Christian life, all right? This is years ago in my, in my early 20s, and, and I had just moved all of my stuff, all of my worldly possessions that fit in a little U-Haul trailer behind a little 1979 brown Toyota Corolla. I had moved all of my possessions from Albuquerque, New Mexico to Denver. Now, by car, that trip is only a seven-hour trip, about 440 miles, but like the fateful minnow in Gilligan's Island, that seven-hour trip turned into a much longer trek. And like the intrepid Gilligan and Skipper and the rest, I would hit storms along the way. Storms not of rain or snow, but a storm of life that turned my plan for my life upside down. Ultimately, it would take me over two weeks and a journey of over 4,300 miles to get from Albuquerque to Denver. Now, why so long, you ask? Well, I'm not going to tell you. See, that's a story for another day. But it was a journey that tested my faith, my prayer life, and it completely and utterly broke my pride. And I'll be forever grateful for it. I'll be forever grateful for what God did in that two weeks. For by the time I finally got to Denver, God began to show up in my life as I enrolled in a wonderful Christian college and found a place to land and grow at the Denver First Free Methodist Church. And this is a picture of the church today. It's now called the River Church, but back then it was Denver First Free Methodist. Same building and everything, all right? Same address, everything. Very little has changed except when I first got there, there was no handicap ramp up to the door. Now, the pastor of this church was an amazing, wonderful man of God. Still is. He's still around. But I soon realized that he had one major flaw, one thing that I criticized about him, <laughs> one thing that I just, I thought, yeah, I don't know if I can get over this. He preached the most boring sermons I had ever heard up to that time. And they were long, boring sermons. Don't say amen like I'm doing that. Stop it. I, I remember I, I'd sit out in the congregation, and, and I'd watch him, and, and I would count the pages as he turned them in his notes. He didn't have a nice little iPad back then. It was just, you know, he had notes. And so I, I'd watch him turn the page. One, page two, three, four. Surely he was getting close to being done. Five, 
six, seven, eight. Come on, preacher, it's getting late. Nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. His record when I was there was a staggering 15 pages written out word for word in very small type. You think I preach a long time? You ain't seen nothing yet. My sermon's only eight pages long. You can handle it, all right? But I knew that the Denver First Free Methodist Church was where God wanted me. So I began to connect with a very loving group of believers who gave this scrawny, big-nosed, bald-headed 22-year-old the chance to minister in new and incredibly fulfilling ways. So I stuck out the boring stuff, and I actually learned a lot from that pastor. He's still a good friend of mine. And as I got more involved in the life of the church and started learning more about this thing called free Methodism, I, I began to hear words, you know, big words, words like entire sanctification and holiness and Wesleyan Arminian theology and dun, 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 dun. I heard the words, the free Methodist book of discipline. <laughs> The Free Methodist Book of... And I thought, what is this? A Free Methodist Book of Discipline? What does that mean? That all sounds like a lot of fun, right? And, and then there were the names that I began to hear. Names like John Wesley and B.T. Roberts and his wife Ellen. This is a book about their life. Look how small the fruit is. They lived an incredible life, or at least incredibly long, I'm not sure. <laughs> B.T. and Ellen Roberts. There was Bishop Leslie Marston. Bishop Marston wrote the ultimate guide to free Methodism called Pastor Dick. What is it? A living witness. A living witness. Oh, from age to age, a living witness. Yeah, yeah. A living with this is actually a soft bound book. I couldn't find my hard bound book. It's about twice as thick, all right, as this. And, and this is, by the way, required reading for every person who wants to become a free Methodist pastor. You got to read at least some of this, all right. And I've I've read the whole thing cover to cover, just once, all right. <laughs> so I, I was hearing all these names and all these books were coming at me and, and and all these words. But as far as I could tell, in my twenty something year old mind, the only thing that all these people really had in common, John Wesley and B.T. Roberts and Leslie Marston, the only thing I could really tell that they had in common was they were all dead. So I thought, why did I need to learn about this stuff? Why did I need to learn about those people and all this, all this stuff? I mean, the only thing that I wanted to do was just bring kids to Jesus. You know, that's, that's all I wanted to do. So why did I need to learn all that stuff? And then I realized something. That the reason I needed to know about them was that I was standing on the backs of those great saints who had gone before me. And the sacrifices they had made and the church they helped found would profoundly influence me in my life. So I owed a debt to them to at least get a glimpse of who they are and, and what they did. So I started with John Wesley, who's up on the screen there, you can see did you know that every church that bears in any way the label of Methodist today is because of this man, John Wesley? Every Methodist church that you see. John Wesley was an Anglican minister back in the 1700s, and he had a profound experience of God's grace and love during a Bible study in a house on Aldersgate Street in London. Now, remember, John was an ordained minister, and, and he had even been to America on mission trips back before our country was even founded. But John Wesley had a problem. He had for many years been trying to earn his way into heaven through his good deeds, and it wasn't working, and he knew it. But on that day on Aldersgate Street, God broke through John Wesley's life, and he realized and knew for the first time the love and grace of God, and that faith in Jesus' death on the cross 
was all he needed for life. And here's what God did in John Wesley's life. He proceeded to set him on fire for the gospel. John Wesley began to go out and preach and teach. And by the end of his life, he traveled an estimated 250,000 miles on horseback. And by the way, 250,000 miles is enough miles to circle the earth 10 times. That's what he traveled on horseback. And everywhere Wesley went, revival would break out. Churches and groups would be formed. And thousands would come to know Jesus as Savior and Lord. Doesn't look like somebody like that could happen to, right? You know? But God did an amazing thing. He would organize the disciples that he made into what we would now know as small groups for worship, accountability, teaching, and prayer. Now, this was something which was completely unheard of at the time. It just didn't happen in churches. And because of this method of organization, Wesley's followers began to be known as what? Methodists. That's where the word comes from. That at first actually was meant to be an insulting term, but it ended up sticking to them, and they adopted it, and so they became Methodists. Now, Wesley preached about holy living and an intimate, close, and loving relationship with God. During his lifetime, and get this, he preached over 40,000 sermons, most often in open-air fields or in tents, uh, to thousands of people at a time without, by the way, the benefit of microphones. Can you imagine being out in our field out here? And, and let's say I'm standing over, over there by the cross preaching, and you're way, way, way back here by, the, by our neighbors here, the house. You know? and, and you imagine hearing me as clear as a bell? That's what John Wesley was able to do. Thousands of people would gather to hear him over and over and over again, 40,000 times. I don't know how many sermons I've preached in my life, but it's not 40,000. Dick, you got anywhere close to that? No, uh uh-uh, no. Amazing. And you and I are here today at the Colville Free Methodist Church in 2023 because of what God did in John Wesley's life 300 years ago. You're here because of that. But you see, John was not the only one who would carry a great influence on what we know as Free Methodism. So we're going to fast forward about 100 years to the 1860s. There was a Methodist minister named Benjamin Titus Roberts, B.T. Roberts. And he would be in conflict with a particular branch of Methodism known as the Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, That particular denomination of Methodism, it was the largest at the time, but it had several things wrong with it. In the first place, most of the churches were pro-slavery. Remember, this is right before the Civil War. Most of the churches were pro-slavery. Uh, They also rented out their pews. Uh, This is a fun one. Uh, You can come in and and you can come into the sanctuary. You can sit wherever you want, right? And I never come up to you and say, give me your money for sitting in that seat. Maybe I should. I don't know, you know. Maybe I should charge Mary $5 for sitting in the front row. But that's what they did. They rented out pews to to families especially. So so if if you were rich, then you got to sit in the front, you know, and now, nowadays, not too many people sit in the front row. <laughs> yeah, what's up with that? You sing louder at Gilligan's Island, and you won't sit in the front row of the church. Come on, people. But back then, it was a status symbol to be seen sitting in the front row because, because everybody could see you, you know? And, and, and they would know. And, and when you came in the church, you would have to do the whole walk, you know, and you could bring your whole family down the center aisle, and you could all parade in, and you could sit in the front row. And you paid for that privilege to do that. And as, as the, the rows would go back, you know, it would get a little cheaper to be in trough. And finally, at the end of, of the sanctuary, back in, in the very back, all right, that's where the poor people stood or sat if there happened to be a seat, but most likely they, they stood. Or, or, or they would even stand in the, in the back beyond the, the doors of the sanctuary. Because you know what? We, we, we can't let those poor folks into our church. Well, they might, they might, they might scuff a pew. You know, they, 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 might, they might not smell right. Well, we don't want them in there. So, so since they can't afford to sit in the good seats, we'll put them in the back. By the way, that practice still continues today. I just found out this past week, if you go to a theater now, if you go to an AMC theater, they're charging more for the good seats, right? So if you want a seat in the middle of the thing with a good view of the screen, you've got to pay more for it, you know? So that practice still goes on in, in some places, all right? Okay, well, that was a problem. 
And, and not only that, but the worship in the Methodist Episcopal Church back then had become dull and, and monotonous, and it was heavily liturgical in nature. If you had dared to raise a hand in worship, like we encourage you to, or if you had dared to sing louder than the rest of the people, well, you would have been shushed, and you would have been shunned. Now, many in the churches also were involved in what were known as secret societies. These were societies outside of the church, and it forced them to take oaths that were in conflict with the Word of God, and those secret societies demanded allegiance first and foremost to that secret order. We still have some of those around today. The teachings of John Wesley about living a holy life and obeying God before man had been shelved in the church at the time, and a spirit of what we would consider liberal feel-good theology had, had taken hold. That's kind of the best way, most modern way to put it. So Benjamin Titus Roberts, B.T. Roberts, began to become very disillusioned with where he saw the direction of the church he was serving in was going. So he tried to change it from the inside out. He wrote articles, he delivered sermons, he went to meetings of ministers where he would urge them to return to the Wesleyan roots of Methodism and the Bible. But B.T. was met with nothing but intense persecution. And at one point, he was actually kicked out of the Methodist Episcopal Church and told not to return. They stripped him of his ordination credentials, said, you can't minister in this church anymore. So, B.T. gathered a few other like-minded men and women, both lay and clergy, and B.T. Roberts and that group first officially organized a new Methodist denomination in 1860 at Pekin, New York. The new work spread rapidly throughout the country and world, and today, the Free Methodist Church exists in over 100 countries. We have approximately 70,000 or so members in the United States, but get this, we have over 1.3 million members in other countries. That's because of how mission-minded free Methodism is, continues to be. In your bulletin, if you have your bulletin, you you have an insert that details the first founding principles of free Methodism that BT and the others put forward to help guide the new movement of God. And I'm not going to go through all of those. You, you You can read those at your leisure if you want. And just like with John Wesley, your presence here today at Colville Free Methodist Church is owed to the sacrifice and dedication of people like B.T. Roberts. Well, so what? So what? It's not 1730, and it's not 1860. It's 2023, and our world has radically changed. There are problems and crises now that didn't exist back then. Does the Free Methodist Church have anything to speak into my life now? and into the lives of my kids and my grandkids. Is it worth being here? And is it worth hitching my wagon to in the form of helping or serving or even just attending our church? Is the Free Methodist Church worth taking a step by saying, I want to belong to this group of Christians that are trying to build God's kingdom here in Colville? I mean, let's get brutally honest for a minute here, shall we? You can go a half mile down the street to the Baptist church, And they have a lot more people, they have a lot more programs, they have a lot more money, they have paved parking lots, and they have some really polished ministries. Or you could go a half mile up the street the other way to the Grace Evangelical Free Church and get the same type of thing. So how is the Free Methodist Church keeping up with those other churches? The answer is pretty simple, we're not. We cannot, and we are not. See, here's the thing. Grace E. Free Church and its leadership and its people have been given giftings and talents and ministries by God to do what God wants them to do. The same with the Baptist Church down the street, the Assemblies of God Church that's across the street from that, the Nazarene Church that's here in town, and every other church in town that holds Jesus as Lord, including here at the Free Methodist Church. See, the body of Christ has different parts, right? But those parts work together to see his kingdom built. I am sure the Baptist church does what the Baptist church does with excellence. And I'm sure Grace Evangelical Free does as well. And I know that we here at Colville Free Methodist do the same. We are all in a race to the finish line, for sure. But we do not run against each other. We run to win the race which God has called us to run. 1 Corinthians 9.24 says, run in such a way as to win the prize. Run in such a way as to win the prize. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that 
a little healthy competition isn't a bad thing. A few weeks ago, I was, I was flying high. Because you, you, you all were here when, when uh, we had the baptistry up here. And, and we baptized two people, right? Jeff and Debbie Paulson, I think they're here today. You know, I think they're right here somewhere. There they are right there. They got baptized. It was a wonderful day. It's fantastic. The Spirit of God was here. I was, I was flying high. It was going to be so good. And, and afterwards, after the service, uh, we got together as we sometimes do with, with some of the people here at our church. And, and, uh, and, and there was a couple that joined us that, that goes to the Baptist church. And, 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 and they're, they're good friends and everything. And so, so we're sitting around talking. And I said, hey, we baptized two people today. And the guy from the Baptist church says, yeah, we baptized seven. <laughs> but praise God. Isn't that cool? He didn't say it in a spirit of competition or anything, you know. All the way home, my wife's going to me, calm down, it's not a competition. <laughs> and I said, I know, it's not, but it kind of is, you know. She said, no, it's not. And I said, no, okay, it's, it's not, but it kind of is. No, no, it's, it's not. The truth is that God has called us as the Colville Free Methodist Church to use our unique distinctives, giftings, and ministries to run the race and build his kingdom one soul at a time. What we do here isn't going to look exactly like the Baptist church does or what Grace Church does or what any other church does. We are called here to help people know, love, and follow Jesus. It's as simple as that. And we do what we can, when we can, in as much strength and with as much excellence as we can to fulfill God's call for us. And can I tell you something, ladies and gentlemen? We are not done yet. Here's why. Uh, this past week, got a, got a message through our Facebook page. And it was Wednesday uh, afternoon that the message came in. And it was from someone I, I didn't know, but it came to, to the church uh, messenger account. And, and I happened to see it. And, and it was just a question uh, from someone here in town. And they, they requested, they said, you know, what do you have for kids on, on Wednesday night? What do you have for teens on Wednesday night? And uh, so I, I messaged back. I said, well, hey, you know, we've got this great thing. We start at 5.30 with a meal, you know, it's called Cross Connect. And, and, uh, and, and then we do a little song time. And then we have classes for everybody. And I said, right now we, we've, got a, we've got a junior high uh, class that, that meets, you know. And I was all excited about that because we got, we got, you know, when they all come, we've got like four, five, six uh, junior high kids that come. It's awesome. It's wonderful. All right. And so I, I was really excited about that, you know. And, and then the message came back, do you have anything for high school kids? And I said, I had to message back, no, I'm sorry, we don't. We're working on it. We want to get there. We want to get a high school group going. That would be awesome. It would be wonderful. And I want to do it before the junior high gets to high school, you know, so that we, you know, <laughs> we want to make that happen. But she needed something for her high school kids. We didn't have anything to offer. I, I don't know what happened. I, I don't know if she went down to Baptist Church or she went up to Grace Church or she went somewhere. Maybe she didn't go anywhere. I don't know. I don't know whatever happened, but, but that type of thing, I, I got to tell you, that type of thing eats at me a little bit as pastor. When, when I hear that there are people that say, hey, you know, we'd, we'd come, but yeah, you don't quite have it yet. That's okay. Again, it's, it's not a competition, and I, I hope and pray that, that, she, that she found what she needs for her kids. But I want you to know something in light of that, that this church will never stand still under my watch as its pastor. We frankly don't have the time to. Every day you and I wake up is another day closer to the return of Jesus, which we fully and completely believe will happen. And honestly, it seems to be barreling toward us at kind of record speed, doesn't it? There are souls to save. There is a gospel to preach. There are relationships to heal. There are literally lives hanging in the balance right now that we as a church need to be ministering to. Those lives may not look like us or have the same skin color as us. They may not have the same financial standard of living as us. They may not smell as nice as we do. They may have children who are loud, rude, and obnoxious. They may be teenagers who spend their day cutting themselves to escape the emotional pain they are in. They may be in jail or maybe they're heading that direction. They may be homeless or heading that direction. They may not know a thing about Jesus, or they may think they know everything about Jesus. They may be one year old, or they may be a hundred years old. They may be married, single, divorced, separated, straight, 
lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, asexual, or something best described by that plus sign. You see, by the way, Jesus died for those people. He died for your gay neighbor or family member. And just because you don't agree with their lifestyle or their sexual identity does not mean they can't know Jesus and experience his grace and forgiveness and love in their lives just like you do. In fact, maybe even deeper than you do. But what are our free Methodist distinctives, if you will? What sets us apart? What are we called to? What makes us different from the Baptist or, or, or Grace Church or, or, or any other church? And over the past couple of years, the leaders of the, of the Free Methodist Church here in North America have set down in writing something called the Free Methodist Way. Now, the insert in your bulletin on the other side of that is kind of a summary of that document. And there's five distinctives that set the Free Methodist Church apart from other families of faith. Uh, and they are these five, okay? They should be up on, on the screen for you here too as well. Life-giving holiness, love-driven justice. Christ-compelled multiplication, cross-cultural collaboration, and God-given revelation. Now you go, whoa, pastor, those are some of those big words. But that's okay, because we're going to break them down over the next several weeks. We're going to take one of these distinctives each week, and we're going to talk about it. And it's not going to be just about, oh, well, this is, this is what we stand for. I want to encourage and inspire you to, to, to launch yourself deeper into these things. What Pastor Dick this, did this morning, when he stood up here and he confessed, that's life-giving holiness. When he stood up here and he asked my forgiveness, and he confessed to that, didn't you feel the life? Didn't you feel the love? That's life-giving holiness. That's what, that's what we want to be about. Love-driven justice. No matter what anybody looks like, sounds like, whatever they do, we as free Methodists want to minister to them. We want to love them. And if they are facing injustice, we want to help heal that. Christ-compelled multiplication. We want more people to come to Christ. Literally, that's kind of what that is. Cross-cultural collaboration. That's going out into the world and, 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 and doing His will in other places. You know, the, the Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We'll talk more about that. And then God-given revelation. That is, we stand on the truth of the Word of God. We stand on the Bible as the Word of God, and we believe what it says, and we live by it. So, those are kind of unfamiliar terms. So, over the next five weeks, we're, we're going to pick them apart. One distinctive at a time. The Free Methodist Church's mission is to love God, love people, and make disciples. And here at Colville Free Methodist Church, we have reworded that just a little to read, helping people to know, love, and follow Jesus. That's our, that's our mission statement. That's what we're all about, to help people know, love, and follow Jesus. Pretty simple, right? That's what it's all about. See, it's all about Jesus, first, last, and only. Here at Colville Free Methodist Church, we do not call you to this church. We call you to come to Jesus, to experience a wonderful relationship with Him, built on faith, hope, and love, to know His forgiveness of your sins, no matter what they are, to enter into a love relationship with the one who loves you unconditionally and completely, so much so that He died for you because He could not bear the thought of eternity without you. That's what we preach. And that's what we live as free Methodists. Our church is not perfect, by the way. No church is. In fact, there's an old saying goes that if you find a perfect church, don't join it because then it won't be perfect anymore. And that's very true. I love that saying. That, should, that saying should be on the, on the, right on as you come in the door, you know. If you're looking for a perfect church, don't join us. We aren't perfect here. We don't have the flashiest and glitziest programs in town. We just love Jesus. We love you. We love your kids. We love your grandkids. Our heartbeat is for you to know that love that will change your life, both now and forever. Now, in a moment, I'm going to show you the first in a, 
in a series of short videos that, that highlight the free Methodist way. There's going to be one for, for each week as we go through this, all right? But, but before we see this video, I want you to pay, as you watch this, I want you to pay special attention to a pastor in this video. His name is Brian. He'll be, he'll be identified. You'll see his name up on the screen. He, he speaks a few times in the video, and I want you to pay special attention to him and to what he says, because you're going to need to hear his story afterwards. Let's play the video. I think the Free Methodist Way is... The Free Methodist Way. The Free Methodist Way is... Well, the Free Methodist Way is... The Free Methodist Way is about these values empowering us as churches to make a huge contribution into society. It's life-giving, it's love-driven, it's Christ-compelled. Freedom to experience his transformation in our life and then see that transformation work in the life of another person. The Free Methodist Church is built on foundations that are, that are really ancient and unchanging and at the same time speak exactly into the moment that we're in. We have a history of Free Methodists as running to the margins. This empowerment that the Free Methodist Church seeks to give people that are, can be the least and last of society really kind of moves my heart. And we don't wait for them to just come our way. We go out into the different places and spaces. Worshiping together, working together, and walking together as one. And this demonstrates to the world the power of the gospel. I, I love the way that these values really connect. One leads to another. It's uh, an, a way to experience abundant life. It calls us to run to the margins, to see the image of God in every person, filled, empowered by God's Spirit, uh, defined by the fruit of the Spirit, and to be able to offer that to other people, to offer that to God. I want that, <laughs> and I hope everybody wants that, because that's part of who we are as Free Methodists. The Free Methodist Way empowers us to make a difference in this world. The Free Methodist Way helps us to be all that God has called us to be, and not just be a show. Because we all want to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to be a free Methodist. I love being a free Methodist. And I pray that we champion this free Methodist way across the world. I'm excited to be a free Methodist. I want to be a free Methodist. I pray that we champion this cause uh, uh, everywhere around the world. Those were the last words from Brian. His name is Pastor Brian Warth. He pastors the Chapel of Change in, uh, down in Texas. The Chapel of Change is perhaps the fastest growing Free Methodist Church right now. Brian has uh, started not just his own church, Chapel of Change, but he has also begun, as of this count, I believe, there are up to 10 church plants that, uh, that he has begun. His goal, by the way, before he retires, is to plant 1,000 churches. 1,000 churches. Now, you see on the, on the left there, that's a picture of Brian as he is today. What you see on the right is a picture of Brian's mugshot. See, when Brian was 16 years old, he was involved in a drive-by shooting in California. Along with a 15-year-old accomplice, Brian was sentenced to life in prison for murder and attempted murder. But God got a hold of him in that jail. And through some very big divine appointments, God worked it so that Brian spent only 16 years in jail out of a life sentence. And when he got out through a, through a journey, he ended up becoming a free Methodist pastor. See, that's what the free Methodist church is all about. Redemption, reconciliation, healing, forgiveness, new life in Christ. And if God can do it in a 16-year-old who is sentenced to life in prison for murder, then God can do it in you. And God can do it in each one of us. So as we close today, I'm just going to ask you to join me for this journey for the next several weeks as we go through some of these. And you're going to be inspired and you're going to be encouraged, I hope. See what God is doing, not just in church, but what God can do in your life as well. Maybe you've never been sentenced to life in prison for murder, but you need Jesus just as much as Brian did. Just stand together and let's close 
with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father and our God, thank you, Lord, so much for what you did in the lives of saints hundreds of years ago, that today we are standing on the backs of those great men and women of God. And, and we continue to proclaim their message, the message which is, goes back when Jesus was born, the message of the gospel, the message that all men can come to God, the message that there is forgiveness and hope and healing at the foot of the cross. Thank you for what you did back then. Thank you, God, for what you're doing now in our church and in our lives. And thank you, God, for what you're going to do in the future. We know you're not done with us yet, God. We know that, and we thank you for that. And we pray, Father, that as we go through this, these next few weeks, and as, as we get a little more grounded in what it means to be a, a free Methodist, Father, that, that you would ignite your fire in our hearts. For it's not about the label of the denomination. It's not about the sign that's out front of the church. It is about Jesus. So God, move in our hearts in powerful ways, we pray. Thank you for this worship time this morning. Thank you for the healing that has occurred. And we pray that that would spread. We love you, God. All praise, honor, and glory be yours. In the strong name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And all God's children said, amen. Amen. Go in peace. Have a great weekend, the Lord. We'll see you on Wednesday night. Don't forget about the potluck for the kids.